Rollins Reviews YouTube channel in unison with the Fine is Wine Cooking channel will be interviewing the fantastic Flo Anthony. Hope to see you there. Hey, 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 good day, everyone. I am pleased to announce that Rolling Reviews and Chef Finest Wine have a celebrity upcoming interview on this Saturday with the incomparable Flo Anthony. Her very extensive resume dates all the way back in the 1970s, the 1980s, 1990s, as well as today. So to be honest with you, Flo Anthony got her start on the Joan River show from way back. Her career includes an extensive television reporting stint where Flo appeared on over 25 talk and news programs, including Geraldo E Entertainment, Joan London, Ricky Lake, Sally Jesse Raphael, Fox News, Entertainment Tonight. I do know she had a few segments on Inside Edition just more recently. In my opinion, Flo Anthony, you are that girl. You're a multi-award winning journalist. Flo is a best-selling author for three novels. She currently has a new novel out. It's called Last Call for a Deadly Diva. So I will put a quick link that you guys could tap on to go over there and check out her novels. We are super excited to have Flo Anthony coming on the show. Much love to you, Flo Anthony. Okay. Hi, Flo. How are you? I hear him a little better. How are you? Fine I'm well. yourself? I'm well. Are you staying safe up there in New York City, Flo? Is it what? Are you staying safe up in New York City? Oh, yeah. I'm inside. It's pretty cold out there. Oh, wow. Yeah. This, uh, well, uh, you know, I've had a few conversations with you and I've told you I have followed your career forever. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have watched you on, um, you know, Headline News with Nancy Grace, uh, Maury Povich, Sally Jesse. Rapper. I never did Maury's show. Now, that's the one I never did. Wait a second. You know, I take that back. I did yeah. do Maury. Yeah, I keep did. forgetting that. <laughs> yeah, because he wanted me to hook him up with O.J. Simpson de Gaulle. <laughs> he did, because they were trying to get him on the show. So I take that back. I did used to do more. You have been on everything. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I have watched you forever. And we thank you for everything you've done, for opening the doors, you know, for <laughs> other African-Americans, you know, in your field. Um, Again, uh, I was going back looking at some of the old clips, and I'm like, "Oh wow!" I, you know, I was I was looking at you in high school, college, still looking at you. Okay, so uh, thank you, kudos to you for everything that you've done, uh, opening the doors that you have opened. And so, my partner and I wanted to uh, interview you and and talk about your life, your career everything and all we want to do we want to show you love and adulation for everything that you've done okay well thank you so much yes yes a part of that love is last call. everybody has my book for me i don't have any for me that's terrible <laughs> y'all go get well thank you i'm so very excited over uh last call for deadly diva uh, I think it's going to be uh, in my last book about this set of characters, uh, Valerie, the black gossip columnist, uh, her friend Rome, who's a former uh, NFL um, Hall of Famer, uh, turned a uh, private investigator, but now runs uh, the security for Dumas Electronics. Her son, her um, stepson, Vance Dumas, 
a black jockey that now has an all black polo team called the Dumas Diamonds Club. And um, the love of her life that after she's been married to Victor Dumas and he died very shortly after they got married, uh, she had just run back into the love of her life from college. So, you know, this whole cast of characters, I think this is going to last call for a deadly diva going to be it. Now. And my next novel will probably be a Christmas novel. So Right, right. Mm -hmm. We would definitely enjoy that. Uh, I want to yes. say shout out to you. Uh, it's such a pleasure. And we, you know, I couldn't make it to the book signing of Frida Payne, but <laughs> I'm so glad that you can come on our show. But we're going to have a quick rundown for Flo Anthony real quick. Oh, yeah. She was an expert for Michael Jackson and O.J. Simpson. I have to, I have to, uh, stop you there because I people thought I was a spokesperson for Michael Jackson but I never was he was just my friend and I couldn't let him go out the way they were trying to take him right. out right oh yeah mm -hmm. um so uh, for that reason I just felt it was my duty to stick up for him because I knew him and I never thought he would hurt a child right uh it, you know it didn't uh help my career a lot I kind of got in blackballed I always felt between him and then also um, taking up for O.J. Simpson, uh, that combination uh, stopped me from getting my own talk show. But it's okay, because life still went on. I still have a career. It's booming once again. And, and uh, well, it never stopped. But the, the uh, TV portion of it, where you would have thought I would have eventually gotten my own show, and that didn't happen. I used to, years ago, have a cable show here in New York called Flo's Place. But uh, Mike, or MJ, as I used to call him, he was just my friend. And I guess, you know, people thought <laughs> that he was my spokesperson. <laughs> I was his spokesperson. <laughs> Either way, I mean, it's a good thing that you showed your loyalty to him oh, yeah. by just protecting yes. him. Always you protect right, him. Right, right. You know. Because and at that time, yeah. Do you still maintain the relationship with the Jacksons? Yeah, I'm, you know, LaToya is like my best friend. And so, um, you know, we text and are on Twitter together and everything. I just got text, two text messages with her, probably three over the holidays. And um, so I do still maintain my relationship with them. Yes. Nice, nice, nice. Um, well, we do know, um, we wanted to ask you, Flo, Anthony, can you kind of break it down for the people that don't know about your history with our girl, Whitney? <laughs> we had to go there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you all don't, y'all cut right to the chase. I, I um, cut right to the chase. I, I was a huge fan of Whitney Houston's. I, I didn't know certain things about her. Um, and I broke a lot of stories uh, about her uh, that, you know, were, were very good. I, I broke when she uh, first started dating Bobby Brown. I called his publicist uh, and asked her. And he she says, well, I don't know. I can't say anything. And then uh, Juanita Stephens. And then she called me back and said, Bobby said, yeah, you can say that he and Whitney are dating. So I broke that. I broke when they got engaged. I broke when uh, Bobby Christina, may she also rest in peace, was born. Yeah. And, and that was kind of uh, funny because Bobby actually told another friend of mine, um, uh, Dennis Thomas, who just recently passed away, the, uh, the saxophone player for Cool in the Gang. He right. told him that Whitney was pregnant. And his wife is like my sister, she told me. Uh, so th there were very good stories that I broke and happy stories. But I did, you know, also write a story, you know, about an alleged overdose. It was not on drugs or anything, even though that's how the call originally came in. Uh, it, it, the, well, the ca call originally came in. It was uh, hard drugs. But then her dad, he's passed away. He he said, change it to diet pills. And uh I did, and then uh, Whitney sued me for forty million dollars. But of uh -oh. course, um, she settled before I settled, and I, the New York Post ended up um, uh, paying her legal fees. Uh, do I wish that wouldn't have happened that day? Because I, someone else was at my house. Uh, I was actually in Florida, and they heard it on my answering machine. And the, it was a Sunday, and I had that crazy city side of the New York Post at that time. I worked at. Um, at page six. 
I had that crazy city side that didn't check things out properly as they should have. And they just went ahead. They added stuff to the store that shouldn't have been. It was just crazy. But um, unfortunately, I didn't know those things about her, you know, of the um, it's no I mean, she's gone on to the great Lord. Now it's no secret of oh, drug yeah. use. I didn't know those things about her. And it was very sad to me. And I truly mm -hmm. wish someone would have helped her. I truly mm -hmm. wish Bobby Christina actually was born on my birthday, March the 4th. I said, oh, I know Whitney not going to like that. <laughs> that <laughs> on my but I wish someone would have helped her. Uh, Tyler mm -hmm. Perry did what he could do. He put her on one of his shows and everything. Right. Um, you know, when Whitney died out there in Los Angeles, uh, Tyler Perry even flew her body back on one of his planes. And uh, he, he tried to help, but I just think more people should have reached out to both mother and daughter. Yeah. That mm -hmm. is just one of the most tragic stories in, in life. Agreed. You know? Agreed. Wow. Well, um, Miss Anthony or Flo, uh, as I normally call you when we talk. No, Flo. Um, my mother was Miss Anthony. I'm Flo. <laughs> you Flo. Okay. I'm just, hey, I'm just going to keep calling you Flo. Um, could you describe your childhood growing up now? Uh, depending on which website you read, some places say you were born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Some say Michigan. I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but I was actually born in Lorman, Mississippi, right. in the infirmary at Alcorn State College. Um, my grandmother, Florence, died in January, and my mom was there. Uh, you know, when she was, uh, you know, almost full term pregnancy with me. So uh, for her mother's funeral. So uh, we stayed. And then uh, my aunt, Eddie May, uh, she was a great educator, Eddie May Jackson, uh, in the state of Mississippi. At that time, she was teaching at Alcorn State College. Oh, Back wow. then, I think it was called um, Alcorn Junior College, I believe. But it all is Alcorn State College now. Oh, so yeah. uh, I was born in the infirmary there, and then Daddy came and got us and took us back up to Ann Arbor, right. uh, where I did grow up. Wow. But I spent a lot of summers in Mississippi, and for some reason, I've never been able to figure it out. I was back in Mississippi when I was two and a half. My aunt at that time was teaching at Cahoma uh, Junior College. Wow. Uh, and um, I think now it's turned to Cahoma State College. But back then, when I was a little kid, it was Cahoma Junior College and Agricultural High School. That, that was in Clarksville, Mississippi. And right. I have all these pictures of me going to kindergarten at two and a half with this Roy Rogers lunchbox. And I just <laughs> never, nobody ever explained it to me. <laughs> But I was there. I still don't even know why they had me in the kindergarten in Mississippi at two and a half. Then I got wow. back to Ann Arbor and had to be back in the kindergarten again when I was older. So wow. <laughs> I still don't get that. But uh, so I, I grew up in Ann Arbor, um, wow. College Town, University of Michigan, uh, because I come from all educators. My grandmother, Florence, uh, she taught school. My uh, wow. great aunt, Winnie, they taught school in very early 1900s. And as oh, I said, my wow. aunt Mae was a teacher, my aunt Stella, my uncle John Prentice uh, in Mississippi, Picking, Mississippi, he was also a principal. Um, and my mother and father were both um, teachers. So oh, wow. I, uh, I grew up in a world of education in a uh, college city, but I chose not to go to the University of Michigan. Now this is gonna sound crazy. It's not racist because you know, I got friends of all colors, oh, but yeah. I really had to go to HBCU because I've been in Ann Arbor and I I was running from white people. <laughs> <It's terrible. laughs> but I just needed my own culture after right, being right. in Ann Arbor all that time. And, you know, I experienced wonderful friendships uh, with white kids and they're still all my friends on Facebook and everything. But yeah. I just wanted to, for, you know, we were coming through that whole black power movement and everything. And I wanted to be at HBCU. Plus, you know, I'm third generation HBCU. My um, wow. my grandmother and great aunt Winnie, they went to um, Tougaloo College. Uh, aunt May May went to Tougaloo College. Uh, aunt Stella went to Tougaloo College. Uh, Uncle John Prentice went to Prayer Review. Or what? You know. Wiley of Prairie, every one of those. I always get confused. My mother went to uh, Russ College in Holly Springs, Mississippi, and my dad attended Tougaloo, but he actually graduated from the University of Michigan. So I said, you know what? I'm going to HBCU. Wow. I'm I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and I left Ann Arbor and never looked back. 
I was, I wow. lived after I got out of college, I lived in Ann Arbor one year and I came on back to New York City. I just, you know, it just was not, it was not a town for me. Right. Uh, I broke a lot of barriers though in Ann Arbor. I was the um, first uh, black kid in the uh, Ann Arbor Civic Ballet, uh, the first black kid in Ann Arbor Junior Theater. Uh, I was the first black cheerleader in Ann Arbor here on high. Uh, wow. The list goes on and on and puts up. Uh, funny though is that my senior year I decided I'm going to be a revolutionary huh? and so I uh dropped out of junior theater after being in junior theater since eighth grade daddy said but we call him Dr. Lockett he was only black psychiatrist in there something's wrong with this girl <laughs> <laughs> she's quit junior theater I mean to get her drug tested but I just I just didn't want to finish out the year uh, being in junior theater anymore because I was also in theater guild at school, radio guild, uh, the cheerleaders. It was a lot going on, and I just didn't feel like um, doing those two major large plays. Right. And plus, as I said, I was a revolutionary then. So, <laughs> so you didn't want to, with that, the rich tradition in your family of educators, when you were a child and you know, you're thinking about what I want to do when I grow up, it, you never wanted to be an educator? Heavens no. I ran so far from school teaching, I didn't know what to do. However, I did teach school for a while because, you know, you can't, I wanted to be an actress. I originally wanted to be a doctor, but I was not smart enough to be a doctor. I'm being very honest. I was not. I had to take biology over again. In fact, I had to go to summer school for it when I was in the 10th grade. Right. So um, I was not smart enough to be a doctor. I soon learned my limitations, even though my dad said, if you can uh, memorize all those lines with all those plays, you ought to be able to memorize math and science. Right. But it just didn't. It was not me. It just wasn't. Right. So um, I majored in fine arts and, uh, you know, I wanted to be an actress from when I was a little kid after I switched up from the uh, doctor ambitions. Right. Who was your greatest inspiration? Huh? Who was your greatest inspiration since you wanted to be an actress? Because there weren't a lot. Um, well, back then I met time. Ruby D because she oh. came to um, Michigan to do a play in the summer for at the Ypsilanti Greek Theater. And her kids, Nora and Guy Davis, they went out to Homestead Acres Theater Camp with me. And so, you know, I became pen pals and everything with Nora when they came back to New Rochelle. And actually, I sometimes I use this little stupid name. I had this other name. It was called Destiny Rochelle. And the Rochelle was for New Rochelle because the Dick Van Dyke show was in New Rochelle. And then I met, you know, the, uh, the Davises and Ruby, D and Ruby D and Ozzy Davis and their kids, and they lived in New Rochelle. So that was my little pen name, Destiny Rochelle. Every once in a while, I still use it if I'm trying to, you know, not let people know it's me. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I guess uh, Ruby D started as my um, first inspiration as an actress because she was the first actress, you know, real actress, working mm -hmm. actress that I ever met. And um, uh, from there on out, you know, I grew to like other people a lot. But, you know, when I was growing up, you just, I think first you had Diane Carroll on television. Yeah. Uh, you had, uh, oh my, we were talking about this woman the other day. She was on, um, oh, I could see her. She was on uh, one of these shows. It'll come to me in a minute. Uh, but uh, then I saw um, Marilyn McCoo on a show uh, once and she was acting, but we didn't have role models like kids have today. You know, when I was coming up uh, in, you know, 60s, 70s, we didn't have that. Um, so well, it would have had to have been Ruby D, yeah. You have been a role model for a lot of women, you know, men, because you were the first starting black African-American woman on a lot of the shows and things like that. I did read that, but I also wanted to know, is it true that an opportunity was potentially presented to you to be on The View show, the show now that we call The View? And what happened? Well, if the opportunity was never presented to me, but one of my producers over at um, Joan Rivers show mm -hmm. um, worked over at The View. And oh. uh, yes, he did want me for The View, but Barbara Walters, uh, she was against it. In fact, they never, you know, he would suggest for me, uh, and another friend of mine, Richard Rubenstein, suggest over there for me, you know, to just, you know, come on once in a while and, you know, do entertainment and this and that. Right. And right. they said no. <laughs> 
that wasn't happening. Oh wow! And but you I, knew exactly why. Because of O.J. Simpson and and Michael Jackson. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Wow! 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 Oh. So, if you could tell us about your start on uh, your first show, we would love to hear that that story. I know you started with Joan Rivers. Yeah, I did begin with Joan Rivers' show, um, and uh, it was very exciting. And at first, they just had gossip on once a week. At that time, I worked at Page Six. They just had it on once a week. But then she started having gossip every single day. Uh, and then from Joan's show, I started to do Geraldo. Um, I did, um, oh gosh, so so many, many shows. Lisa Giddens show. I mean, it just, it was every every single day. Uh, Rolanda Watts show. It, it, it was incredible. I'm still waiting to hear from Ro. I would really love to interview Ro. <laughs> I gave her, I passed along the number. She's pretty busy. She just got a new role in a, a film. So Okay, that's, she's busy. Okay. And Flo, yeah. I love Patty. I want to see some Patty LaBelle. We, we love Patty on the show. You know, I be cooking some of her recipes out of her cookbook on my channel. You know, I made her sweet potato pie. I bought them from Walmart. You're better than me trying to make them. No. You bought I love Patty LaBelle. Um, in fact, uh, years ago, I um, went to her house uh, in Philadelphia. It was her son Zuri's birthday. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we got there, my little crew, we were late. They were all running the hairdressers and stuff, driving from New York. And we got there, and there wasn't any food left. And she sent out uh, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, have food brought in for me and then sent uh, had... Um, John Perignon brought up from her um, wine uh, basement and all, as she wow. said, you will never come to my house and say that and go on TV and said, I didn't feed you, give you something to drink. But I just love her. She's just so wonderful. Her energy yes. is just so yes. positive. Touchable. Uh, I, I just love, love, love her. Yes. But, Touchable, friendly, and it's almost like you know her. That's the way she treats you, like you already know yeah, her. Yeah, it's, you know, it's she's an, an incredible performer and an incredible human being. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Very, very kind, I must say. Oh, yeah. If you could choose a theme song to describe where your life is at this, this point right now, what song would you choose and why? Uh-oh. Well, you know, I, 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 my theme song used to be to be young, gifted, and black. I really did used to get up every morning and play the song oh, after wow. I said my prayers. And I still like it, but now I'm old, I uh, guess, and somewhat gifted and still black. But <laughs> every day I sang that. But it would probably be um, uh, uh, a hymn that I like um, also that I'm no ways, it's called I'm No Ways Tired. I don't oh, believe yeah. you brought me this far to leave me. I sing that most mornings now, um, or listen to it. Uh, I also uh, like um, um, "You'll Never Walk Alone." Oh, That's another yes. one of my favorite songs. So, wow. Um, and you know, my life um, today, of course, no one's life is perfect, but it's right. a pretty happy life. And I've basically always been a pretty happy person. Now, my cousin Rita used to say, you're the only person I know that gets up in the morning smiling. Um, <laughs> but I came out of that kind of household with my parents right. and all. And so I am, um, I try, I'm always um, striven to be happy and to always have an, um, a, a good outlook on life and to right. always just want to uplift people and to, you know, be uplifted myself and, and, and everything. So um, it's a very happy life now. Um, you know, um, my career is doing great. It's got, it's like on a column comeback. <laughs> I now have four columns. I just got two new ones. Um, uh, last spring, I got the opportunity to write uh, the South of the Highway column in Dan's Papers, which is a paper out in the Hamptons. And then the same wonderful owner, Victoria Schneps, it's called Schneps Media. My friend, uh, Todd Shapiro is who actually got me the job with the South of the Highway. Uh, about last month, she asked me, could you do something similar uh, to this in AM New York for uh, $100 more a week? I said, oh, sure. And I said, well, can I call it Big Apple Buzz? 
And she said, oh, that's great. So now I have um, South of the Highway, I have Big Apple Buzz. I, my Go With The Flow column is now in two more Black papers. It's in Caribbean Life, which Schneps Media also owns, and in New Jersey, UrbanNews.com. And uh, I have this back to sports again. Uh, I used to have this column called Keep Punching in the uh, Black American newspaper. That's how I kind of went to the post um, for the uh, sports agate job, the New York Post. And um, so I've got the Keep Punching column. It's in a young woman's um, magazine. It's called LVM. So it's exciting. I still, you know, I'm on the radio daily uh, with gossip on the go with flow. And it's, I really love what I do. And I've got this novel out here that I'm trying to permit in the midst of a pan. I'm trying to promote in the midst right. of a pandemic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the last call for a deadly diva. So All we right. wanted to let you know that we support you and we got that book like right away, you know, because I really appreciate it. I need people to rate it on uh, barnesandnoble.com or walmart.com, target.com, wherever you get it. I need it to be rated because my books right. have always really done well, but it's because I was out in bookstores right. selling them. You know, every week I had book signings, sometimes right. two or three times a week. And with this pandemic, I've only had two book signings and they weren't in, you know, bookstores. Oh, so yeah. that you, they don't get counted. And I right. just want to throw that out there. She's a three-time bestseller book. So just want to make sure I threw that out there as well. That's right. Thank you. Yes. Now, since you said uh, you're, you have an illustrious career so far as your relatives are concerned in education, I want to know what subjects were your favorite in school and who was your favorite teacher? Well, my favorite subjects, of course, were always English because I could always write. Um, mm. I also liked um, um, golly, social studies quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, because I always was very interested in politics from a little kid. Right. And I also liked, um, gosh, what else I like? We, we already know I didn't like math and science and that's yeah. too much left. So <laughs> 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 and because I've been a cheerleader since I was in the 10th grade, I didn't ever have to take gym. You know, even when I got to Howard, I was a cheerleader the first year there. So, you know, right. I have to take gym. So I never in high school had to take gym. Oh, wow. Uh, nice. Um, I wanted to ask you, I do know that you worked with Geraldo. And uh, there was a most historical like episode on there where there was some type of altercation. Um, and I understand that it was someone had gotten kind of physical with you. Could you tell us about that? Well, they didn't get physical. Um, it was with a Ku Klux Klansman. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in fact, um, my, my cousins called me up. They said, you know, it's coming back. you can't be on national TV it's be fighting. fighting with a Ku Klux Klansman <laughs> in his full regalia. I mean, he had the hat, the red, <laughs> We are not in New York to protect you. Oh, but my But I was goodness. so upset. It was about O.J. Simpson. He called, he said that he was glad that, that, um, uh, and I'm just going to put out what he said. That nigger loving bitch who had those, uh, what did he call those kids? Some kind of gremlins. It was horrible. And right. I said, you better take that back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You take yeah. that back or I might come down there and punch you. And then, then he said, you see, <laughs> nigger bitches are violent. <laughs> oh, wait, what? Oh, yeah, on national television. Whoa. I almost fainted. <laughs> I, I, was, I couldn't believe, I can't remember what he called them, mongrel kids or something. <laughs> Whatever he said was horrible. Yeah. It was just horrible. Right. And oh I, I could, first of all, I just still don't understand that Geraldo had the man sitting up there with his looking back on it. That was crazy. <laughs> wow. Wow. It was looking back on it. That was nuts. But, you know, that's how I got my first book deal with the Keeping Secrets Telling Lies. It came from Dove Books originally with this guy, Michael Wiener. And right. he used to tell me off on Geraldo. I mean, it was just awful. I mean, he was just, so my cousins called me again. They said, do you have this man's number? Because we really feel we need to call him up. And so one day my phone rang and I said, hello. He said, hi, Flo, this is Michael Wiener. I said, oh God, are you coming to New York to kill me? <laughs> and he said, no, 
that's all show business. He said, I actually really like you and admire your guts. And, and, and I just do. I said, oh, OK. So then he said, I'm doing a series of um, African-American mystery books. And I would like you to write the entertainment one. Wow. And so that's how uh, Keep Me Secrets Telling Lies came about. Wow, wow, wow. Whoa. What brought on Last Call for Deadly Diva? What inspired you to do this uh, very- Well, um, Wahida Clark is my publisher, Wahida Clark Presents. And I it was last year, of, um, um, for, well, I guess it was probably like uh, last September or around in there, uh, they put five books together and, you know, packaged them together. And that right. day I sold the most books. So they called me and asked me, are you working on another book? <laughs> yeah, you got another book here? And I said, you, you know, I do have one in mind, uh, you know, Last Call for a Deadly Diva. And um, I said, you know, let me go for it. And so she sent me a contract and that's how that came to be. And um I, I don't know if it's because pandemic and then I, you know, I moved last year in the middle of the pandemic. I actually moved where I am now, December 28th of 2020, going into 2021. Right. So that book was slow. Usually my books just mm -hmm. kind of flow out of me. I go to sleep dreaming about the characters. And when the book is finished writing, I miss the characters so much. But Last Call for a Deadly Diva was moving slow. It just wasn't clicking. And then all of a sudden, uh, we, we have, uh, they have weekly editorial meetings. I don't always take part in them um, uh, by, by Zoom. One day, Wahida said, you know, some of you all need to stop talking so much and keep writing. <laughs> and I knew she was talking to me because I was late. And it's the first time I've ever right. been late. So then I got on the good foot and I, and I pumped the rest of it on out. Uh, but, you know, it, it came to me as I was writing. I did not have a a total outline for that. So um, it came to me as I was writing, but it's right. got uh, the characters in Last Call for Deadly Diva, the new ones I added. I mean, they're like really some characters. <laughs> they are. You know, I got these twin strippers and uh, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, uh, dubious pasta, but she's a very good person underneath right. it all. And uh, it, it's a lot of fun. Sounds good, Flo. Um, what, who are some of your favorite artists? Again, I know you know so many people because you've been in the business 40 years. So I can't quite, your, didn't quite hear you, Lynn, hon. Who are some of your favorite artists? Okay, well, we talked about Patti LaBelle. She's one. Uh, Wynton Marcellus. Of course, the Jacksons, uh, you know, all of them, Latoya and Michael, right. you know, my dear friends. And I, I know Jermaine pretty well, too. Um, and I I also liked their father quite a bit and loved right. their mother. Uh, you know, Mr. Jackson, the uh, first time I ever ran to him was at a fight in Las Vegas. And oddly enough, he and Marlon were sitting like right near where we were sitting. And... Um, he came over to me and he said, that's when Latoya was estranged from her family. Right. He said, tell Latoya she could come home. And oh, wow. uh, I just thought that was, you know, it was, it kind of surprised me. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll pass it along. And so then when um, Latoya had problems with her husband, Jack, of physical oh, yeah. altercation, her mother called me at the mm -hmm. New York Post and said she didn't even have Latoya's phone number. Oh, and wow. Mrs. Jackson said to me, I want to thank you for standing by her. At least I can go to sleep at night and know she has one friend. Exactly. And I just, so their parents' perspective of what was going on and the dynamics of that family are just so different than right. people think it is. Exactly. You know, so uh, of course mm -hmm. them. I like Sylvester Stallone a lot too. Um, oh, wow. His mom was a very good friend of mine. Uh, and I knew his uh, his brother Frankie was very involved in boxing. Right. So of course, you know, Sylvester did all these Rocky movies, and now it's brought Creed to us. Um, oh gosh, I like so many people, and they're all going to get mad at me. They're going to say, "Well, Flo, what happened?" Leon Isaac Kennedy, Lynn Whitfield, uh, went to school with it, everything. I mean, it's a lot of people that I, I like uh, quite a bit. Vivica A. Fox. Oh yeah. Also. Um, 
um, Lisa Ray McCoy. Oh, wow. I like her quite a bit. Lauren Hilton Jacobs. In fact, they've got a movie coming out together, Lisa Ray and uh -huh. Larry Jacobs. So um, it's, I like quite a few artists quite a bit. Oh, wow. Um, Flo Anthony, you know, you are that woman who had the tea on pretty much everybody, you know, still to this day, you do have some, you've had some segments on E! Entertainment, your most recent one. Can you tell us about that? Um, I haven't done anything on E! recently. I was doing some stuff for TV One and for, um, um, uh, TV One on Unsung and Life After. Oh, yeah. And I was doing some stuff um, with um, Entertainment Tonight. Oh, I did okay. something recently. And um, most recently, last week, I did some stuff with um, Cheryl Wills for uh, New York One for her show uh, when, of course, Lenny 48 passed away. Right. But um, yeah, I really do enjoy doing TV, and it's interesting that they're starting to call me again. But I think part of it is I'm back in mainstream media with the, you know, AM New York and the dance papers and all. So um, because I never had an agent or anything, I did all that television because people would read the stories I was writing and then have me come on and talk about them. And it's very different now because I have a friend uh, that was doing a particular show and they were saying, well, maybe I'll try to get you on that show. I said, yeah, I could use the $700. They said, well, where are you going to get $700? I said, isn't that what they pay you to be on the show? <laughs> and he said, no. I said, no. <laughs> Why are you on there? <laughs> oh, boy. I said, Why are you on there then? And then, of course, when Michael Jackson uh, married Lisa Marie Presley, oh, um, yeah. uh, back then, um, Inside Edition paid me um, $1,000 a day to be exclusive to them. And then when Michael Jackson passed away, uh, right. Entertainment Tonight and the Insider paid me $10,000 to be Whoa. exclusive to them. Nice. Uh, and I had Michael Jackson. I took him on Inside Edition years ago um, when he, he and Spike did the uh, They Don't Really Care About Us video. Right. And okay. uh, they paid me, uh, which was kind of a ripoff. They paid me $15,000, but I was like, oh, my God, I'm rich. I'm rich. <laughs> but that guy, that horrible guy that uh, did the interview with Mike, I can't even think of his name did the interview with Mike where, where they saw Mike with the kid that poor, the kid that had cancer. Oh, um, yes. and, and that's how all those charges that came against Martin Bashir is his name. Right. He got paid a hundred thousand dollars for that interview and uh, sold it to him. So, you know, that there, there's little differences going around here, but it doesn't matter uh, because um, yeah, it is sort of about the money, but at the same time, <laughs> and Michael Jackson was always so kind. Uh, when I asked him about doing the inside edition, he said, you go ahead and negotiate with them and whatever they pay you, you just take it. So no. right. That's, right. that's what happened there. Yeah. I wow. wanted to reiterate, Michael was your friend and you made it clear that you didn't work for him, right? No. No, not him. I got a couple things for LaToya once in a while, you know, um, but it, that mainly was a uh, friendship too. Right. And for those that do not know, um, Flo Anthony also was around during the trial of the OJ Simpson situation. Yep. Uh, and I understand that you were also friends with OJ. Yeah, I actually knew him for a long time. Um, my friend Reggie McKenzie, he went to the University of Michigan. Uh, right. He blocked for OJ at the Buffalo Bills. Whoa. So I had known him for a long time. And then um, he would come to New York quite often and I would run into him. In fact, one time he was at Mickey Mantle's restaurant and he sat down with my friend Copper and I. And she, when he, uh, I think he left before we left. It was an event. I can't remember the exact event. And she said he was so nice. I didn't think he liked black women. I said, well, you got a black mom and a black sister. Right. I had a black guy, got black children. So. Yeah, he better like black women. She said he was really nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, my doorbell is ringing. Uh, can you guys, because I know who it is. Can I, you guys hold on like two seconds? No, that's fine. You'll be right here right, when you come back. Seconds. Yeah. I just have to do something. Okay. Can we see the chat? Who's in there? Right. Yes. Highlight Good some man. of the comments. Uh, Partner. 
Yes. Can we see the comments? Uh, uh, uh. Yes, I'm I can gonna... see them. I can't see. Who uh -huh. are, who's uh -huh. all in here? Oh, Jill's Comfort Zone, Reese Cup, VT, Deborah Toomer's here. Um, Kale is here. B Sugar is here. Donna is here. Silas Mukbang is here. Um, see who else? I'm getting everybody a shout out. Um, okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. <laughs> You're fine. Tina's here. Rosalind's here. Huh? Uh, we were just giving everyone a shout out. Everyone that was here. Oh. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here with Thank the legendary Flo Anthony. We have her links down in the description box for her books and all of that. And we well, love Flo Anthony. Yeah. And we, we also wanted to know, um, what would you like your fans to know most about you? That I um, love life and um, uh, I consider myself a very warm and you know, loving, kind person. And um, I love life. And I just want to wish everyone to stay safe during this pandemic. It is far from over. If y'all noticed to get my laundry, I had a mask on to answer my door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, it's just, you know, it's important to stay safe. How did you avoid the pitfalls of fame? We see it so often where you know, people may start out well and then, you know, things happen and then, you know, the, you know, drug usage, drinking. How did you avoid that? Well, you know, I've had I've had one pitfall years ago. I had a legal situation, but that was many, many years ago. Right. Like uh, 30 some years ago. Um, but um, well, I love wine, so I guess I didn't avoid that one. <laughs> <laughs> But I, you know, I never was interested in uh, drugs or anything. I just, you know, never. I always liked uh, wine. But um, I don't know. I've always think it's best to keep as clear of a head as you can. Right. Um, advantage and it just never was my thing. Are there any plans for a biography or a memoir in the works? Yeah, people are always asking me about a memoir and why he didn't want me to do a book about journalism. Right. Uh, but, you know, I don't know if I'm ready for a memoir yet. I mean, it, we used to say, well, my friends and I say, if they would have had social media when we were young, we would have been assassinated. <laughs> I'm, all, <laughs> I'm close to getting assassinated now. You know? <laughs> oh, no. No, we have, never. We have one last question for you. If you could go back in time, what are three things that you would tell your younger self? What I would do again, I'm sorry, a little louder. Okay. Huh? If you could go back in time, what are three things that you would tell your younger self? Uh oh. Um, boy. gotcha. <laughs> you got me on that one. Um, I don't think I would tell my younger self, uh, anything, uh, maybe to, uh, try to save money um instead of uh you know spending it all the time but probably not i mean i you know i love nice things and i always bought mm -hmm. nice things for myself um right. you know whenever um my mom and i you know would do plays or get different things stuff growing up or recital if we got a little piece of change from it we would buy mm -hmm. something for for it to remember the event from and so I don't think I would have changed anything. I can't, I always wanted to live in New York City. I wow. came here all by myself is when I finished college. Um, I, I I don't think I would change anything. I love my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta. I wouldn't change pledging that. I, you know, I was married once. I got out of it pretty fast. I don't regret that. Right. Um, I really don't have any regrets. And I've been through the last 10 years, I kind of went through a tough financial period, um, actually since 2009. So that's um, a, right. 11 years. I went through a, um, a, a tough, um, 12 years. I went through a tough financial period uh, because my radio show income changed. It went from being a set salary to when I got a new syndicator, it's based on the advertising. But even now that has leveled out where it's okay. Um, right. So. I just, um, 
I don't think I would change anything. I I, I enjoy life, mm -hmm. and um, I, Lord knows because I'm just having such a wonderful time now. I'm not ready to go anywhere, so I hide in my house from this <laughs> pandemic. Except when I have to get out to work with Michael, uh, Sphinx and stuff. But I um, I hide in the house too. Right. But I wouldn't change anything. Um, I wouldn't have done it differently. I, you know, I don't have any children. People say, don't you regret that? I said, no, because I only stayed married a short time and I had all these tired boyfriends. And nobody was married. So <laughs> <laughs> what would I have done with the kids? So, <laughs> I don't have any real regrets. And, and that's interesting, but I really don't. It's never too late. Love is out there for you, Flo, I believe. <laughs> you know, you're very... Uh, successful woman, you know, I must say. And what is your, what is the goal for you from here on out? That you um, I guess uh, from here on out is to keep, um, well, I'd love life to go back as it was, you know, prior oh. to the pandemic. I'm going to tell you something. There was a psychic, her name was Sylvia Brown. She was on um, oh, yeah. um, Montel Williams a lot. Yeah, I remember her. And, you know, I used to be on Montel's show and everything. Um, in fact, I gave him the first party he had when he came to New York and all. And he sent me flowers and everything. I, you know, I like him. And so um, one day she touched my stomach. Mm. And she said, she just, I don't know where touched my stomach. Now, you know, you probably say that's assault or something. She touched my stomach. <laughs> she said, you have to go to the doctor. Oh, she said, wow. you got to get something checked out. And um, I had actually, I had had a bleeding problem for a long time. But as my doctor says that uh, I only crawl in there if I'm half dead. So I, I knew something <laughs> probably was wrong. And I went and I had ovarian cysts. I had to have surgery uh, for ovarian cancer. Uh, oh, wow. And, uh, when, um, yeah, uh, when they also found... Um, uh, fibroids and they and endometriosis. I was very, very sick. And so she said, uh, wrote way back when that there was going to be a horrible viral disease that affected the lungs, virus. And wow. it was going to come, but when it left, it was going to leave as mysteriously as yeah. it left. And she had the exact year, 2020, everything. Oh, wow. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, she's away now. Yeah, uh, but you could, if you Google that, you could see that. And so I just, um, I do believe that we can get out of this. You know, people get vaccinated, people wear masks. Uh, it's not good to be in big crowds. If you do keep your mask up as much as you can, but we only, only going to get out of this if we work together throughout this nation and this world. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so I would like to see things go back there. Uh, you know, where you didn't have to have on a mask. You didn't have to be scared of your shadow because this has turned me into a nervous wreck. I mean, I'm scared mm -hmm. of my shadow. Right. <laughs> so, um, so that's a goal. I'd like to see that happen. And uh, right. I, we've got pretty good plans so far for 2022. Right. Um, with Michael uh, Spinks, he's doing a thing called Live Train, where it's... Um, it's virtual boxing training. We did some filming uh, this past week. He also has crypto boxers. Uh, and so that's a NFT uh, clothing line and also cryptocurrency, um, private signing next week. So we're busy. You know, right. we're, we're trying to forge through this uh, pandemic and keep it moving. So I guess that's my goal, just to keep it moving. <laughs> Flo, I'm going to have to look that up. I didn't know that uh, Sylvia Brown yeah, made Sylvia that Brown. prediction. Oh, prediction. But I know she yeah. was on his show all and the And the time. only reason I kind of, I mean, that woman touched my stomach and it was so much wrong with my stomach. I don't know how I was eating. <laughs> 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 and first she just looked at me and said all that. Did it wow. scare you? When she told you that, did it scare you? No, I did go to the doctor because, as I said, I wasn't. Um, I was having a uh, long um, menstrual periods, and so right. I, I mean, I knew something was going on, but I, you know, I counted it up to stress or something, you know. So. Oh wow. Mm hmm. Well, I'm glad that you. Well, I really didn't go. Yeah. I actually fell out at the New York Post. <laughs> no way. No. They took me to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! So that's kind of, that kind of forced you to go. You that had kind of forced to go. You to go. Oh, boy. 
Wow. So Sylvia Brown was the real deal. Yeah, she was a real deal. She got into trouble with one prediction about she said that some child wasn't dead and they later did find the child dead. Oh, but yeah. perhaps when she said it, maybe the child wasn't dead, you know, and then the yeah, person who killed that. the poor baby. I remember yeah. that one. But well, she used I to help the police that. out a lot. She did. She sure did. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. <clears throat> And O.J. Simpson, you guys were friends, you know. What would you say that was the hard part of seeing the whole trial situation? What, what was so? What was the hard parts of seeing that? Because I know you were around during that whole time. Of yeah, the trial. Um, I was like the most sought after guest on talk shows because I was the only person that took up for O.J. Simpson or Michael Jackson, <laughs> so they needed somebody <laughs> like me, even though. <laughs> The whole thing was just difficult, you know. Nicole being murdered—that—that uh, right. that was horrible. Uh, the whole thing was just very difficult when you look back upon it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have not been able to get in touch with him uh, since he came out of jail. I wrote a letter uh, right. to the attorney; they didn't answer me. I left a message, but I've heard that he's not with that attorney anymore because I've been right. in Vegas several times. Uh, so I would like to see him, but I don't even know now that he's off of parole. He most likely, I would think, would leave Vegas and go on back to uh, Florida right. where he was living in Coconut Grove. Yeah. Yeah. He, you know, he always makes the headlines, though, for sure. That he does. That he does. And he was even on Twitter um, talking about, you know, Antonio Brown and his theatrics at the Tampa Bay Jets. I've seen game that. I've seen it. I've seen it. I did, too. <laughs> I'm an Antonio Brown fan because he's a great football player and I like, you know, wacky people. So, yeah, they're saying um. that he has a little <laughs> I but like, we love I OJ, like though. people that are a little different. <laughs> but we love OJ. We, lo we love OJ Simpson, too. Yeah. He appears to be a nice guy. Yeah. Um, I just misguided. You know, he needs some guidance. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Flo Anthony, for coming on the show. And we want to appreciate everybody for being here. If you have some last questions for Flo Anthony in the chat, please don't be afraid to ask. And it has been an awesome interview thus far. Yes. And I live in Chicago. I'm a chef. So if you're ever in Chicago, want a plate, come on, swing by. You know, Michigan is not far from me. So Yeah, I don't ever get home. I haven't been home to Michigan in, in about five years. Um, wow. I was thinking about, you know, going, we always get, once all of our parents died, we did a cousin's Christmas. Right. And I, I mean, I'm hope to God, maybe we could do that um, next year. That you know, right. This pandemic will be where you could, you know, gather at Christmas again. Wow. That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we have thoroughly enjoyed uh, this interview. Thank you so much for taking time oh, out. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I have thoroughly enjoyed it too. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Sorry for the laundry interruption. <laughs> no problem. It's a lot of stuff you could have been doing, but you came here. So we have. Exactly. I wasn't doing that much. I've been uh, just binge watching the Beverly Hillbillies all day. <laughs> but now I'm getting ready to watch a football game. <laughs> I love that show. Oh, my God. Uh -huh. yeah. I love it. I have a friend named Jeffrey Pulliam. I let him know that we were going to be interviewing you. He's a big fan of yours. He says, oh, I just love her voice. And her voice is so soothing. And, you know, he had nice things to say. So shout out to you, Jeffrey Pulliam. I had to let you know that I'm going to let Flo Anthony know what you said. So Thank oh, yeah. you, Jeffrey. That's so nice of you. Flo, also Reese Cop, Donna Joyner. When I, when I told them that we were going to be interviewing you, they were just ecstatic. Who was that? Reese Cop and Donna. They're in the chat now. They just love you and your work. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy Martin Luther King Day. Yes. Shout out to Roland Reviews for doing such awesome work. Jill's Comfort Zone, B Sugar 100, Reese Cup, William Battle. These are all the people that are in the chat right now. Oh, Flo yeah. Anthony, Deborah Toomer, Donna Joyner, VT, all supportive people. We appreciate you guys. You. Backyard Life. Oh, that's, 
That's not Donna Joyner, the fitness trainer, is it? No. Oh, okay. No, that's another. <laughs> that was Donna oh, Joyner. Right. They got a lot met. of these Donna Joyners. <laughs> that was the Donna Joyner you met at Frida Payne's uh, book signing. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll have to send you a picture of her. Thank you again, Flo Anthony. All you right. Thank you so blessed. much for having me and enjoy the rest of the weekend and be blessed. Yes, ma'am. You, you too. Soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, partner. All righty. Okay. Thank you, guys. Share out the video, and we appreciate you guys for the dynamic duo, Chef Finest Wine and Rolling Reviews, and we are excited, and we appreciate the support always, always, always. Okay. All right, partner. Love you. Okay. Love you too. All right. We'll talk later. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, supporting. Again, Chef Fine is wine, as well as myself, Roland's Reviews. We we love you. We thank you. Um, and stay tuned because we're working on uh, doing something on Monday to honor Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. So stay tuned. You'll see a video pop up letting you know what it's going to be about and what we're going to be doing. Okay. So please enjoy the rest of your day. Remain safe. And we will see you in a couple of days. Right. Hollow back. See y'all later.